episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yeah. All the way live from Black Girl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Well, okay, I hope everybody had a good long weekend. If you had to work, I hope you had an opportunity to do whatever it is that you do to celebrate America's independence. And for those of you who still struggle with the meaning of American independence, I hope you found some peace and joy and did something just to relax. Uh, I recognize that this particular holiday, it means different things to different people, but I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I like warm weather holidays. Anytime I can get in front of a grill, I'm a happy girl. So for me, the holiday was cooking all weekend i cooked for multiple people i had lots of fun doing it and then i went down to bloomington hung out at the pool grilled some more made some steaks made some more ribs i just like to grill i enjoy that and you know who is ever on the grill is the king of the grill i'm just saying everybody knows that but I hope you enjoyed your time off, time with family, family reunions, whatever it is that you guys did. I hope you enjoyed it because yes, we are in some desperate, desperate times. Things are not looking good, but this is an opportunity. But let me, let me get to my rant first. Let's read some of these articles that have been coming out so we can get to our fantastic guests, which Yo, y'all real hyped about tonight, and I'm loving it. The Indiana St Indianapolis Star reports, California has banned state-funded travel to Indiana due to its recently enacted bill prohibiting transgender girls from participating in girls' sports. It's unclear how many Californians would be prohibited from traveling here, but they also did it in like 20 other states. California's Attorney General Rob Banta added, Indiana is the, on the list of 20 states where such travel is prohib prohibited when House Bill 1041 went into effect July 1st. Um, he says that his state is committed to standing against discrimination in all forms. Make no mistake, there is a coordinated ongoing attack on transgender rights happening right now, all across the country, Banta said. Blanket legislation targeting transgender children is a solution in search of a problem. It is detached from reality and directly undermines the well-being of our LGBTQ plus community. Y'all, see, losing money. Losing money. Because, you know, listen, we know we are trying, like the Dickens, to attract conventions, attract people, attract whatever we can to come to our state and if, you know, if they're not even coming for business trips, come on, they're not coming for business trips, that's not good. See, these are, these are the kind of bills that make Indiana look bad and people don't want to come here. In fact, they flee. The Indianapolis Star also reports, Indiana Democrats accuse Republicans of holding much needed economic relief hostage by delaying the upcoming special session in order to craft a bill focused on restricting abortion access. Governor Holcomb had originally called lawmakers back for a special session starting on July 6 to send a collective $1 billion back to Hoosiers in order to combat inflation. If approved by lawmakers, each Hoosier would receive $225. Once the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, lawmakers pushed back the start date to July 25th in order to also address abortion. Spokeswoman for both the Republican House and Republican Senate said legislative leaders made the decision to minimize logistical issues. Restricting abortion may mean more children in poverty. Indiana already lags on funding. Democrats, including Anderson's Representative Terry Austin, went to the State House on Wednesday to prove a point. But because they're in a super minority in both chambers, they have little power. Given that we're now looking at a three week delay for even starting the conversation on how to best distribute economic relief, Austin said, we wanted to come here today to tell Hoosiers that we are ready to work for them, even if our colleagues on the Repub Republican side of the aisle are not. Senator Shelley Yoder of Bloomington argued 
Lawmakers could have met at the state house as planned by, on, on July 6 to pass some of some form of economic relief and then return later to address abortion access if they choose. Relief should not be held hostage to the supermajority, unpopular and disorganized policy debate. Our liberty, our livelihoods should not be subject to the whims of the supermajority. Uh, but to be clear, some Hoosiers still have not received their first $125 check. So it looks like there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But of course, we know this is what Republicans do. They will hold your whole life on hold as long as they can restrict you from doing anything that you might want to do. This is what they do. We, we want small government. We want it so small that we can control everything that happens in your private life. This is what we're working with, y'all. But if we're not dealing with abortion rights and, and, and right to privacy and those types of things, we have to deal with mass shootings. And unfortunately, in Highland Park, we had another one on the 4th of July. And this clown, this clown was like, oh, man, there's another event in Wisconsin. Dang, if I only had enough time. See, I, something's wrong. And, and it's not just mental health. If you didn't have access to war-style weaponry. But uh, Fox 59 reports a group of Indiana clergy leaders is calling on the governor to press for new gun safety laws in the state. A recent open letter published in the Indianapolis Star calls on Governor Holcomb to use this month's special session to repeal the state's new permitless carry law, a law that took effect last Friday. Any Hoosier is allowed to carry a gun without getting a, a permit. The clergy also is calling for a ban on assault weapons. Lawmakers plan to discuss direct inflation and abortion, but I imagine gun legislation isn't on the table. Our governor and our legislators need to use this session, this special session for gun violence prevention, prevention, said David Malott, president of Christian Theological Seminary. The truth of the matter is that we are experiencing a crisis of gun violence, and it has become a public health issue in our city, in our state, and in our country. We want them to take meaningful action to curb violence in, a, in our streets. In response to this letter, Governor Holcomb's office <clears throat> said, the special session was called by Governor Holcomb for legislators to pass the governor's inflation relief package. The legislators can discuss any issue they decide to tackle. You know, it would have been cool if the leader of our state had enough courage to actually say or do anything to protect Hoosiers. I understand you want to give us some relief and we all down for the, the money. We, we could all use a little. I went to the store. Thank God Kroger had buy one, get one free on the baby back ribs. I'm trying to tell you because <laughs> the food in the grocery stores are expensive. Everything is expensive. And we also know the, the, the gas and fuel industry are gouging us. We know these things. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have, have relief. We should definitely get some relief. However, we have some real, we have some crisis issues also happening and we should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. If they can sit around and figure out how to restrict a woman's uh, uh, reproductive rights and her access to reproductive health care, then somehow or another, we ought to be able to sit around and talk about why we can't restrict assault rifles. You don't need one. You don't need one. We had a ban before. It's not unconstitutional. It's not expressly written that you can have an AR-15 because, you know, Justice Alito wants us all to go back to the time when everything was explicitly written in the Constitution. Right? I mean, as he said, we you know, we Roe was wrong because all the other precedents were about taking a life, a potential life, but not passing some type of gun sensible gun laws, sensible gun regulation with a weapon that is designed to actually take life. That's what it's made for. Whether it's a four legged life or a two legged life it's designed to maim, harm and kill, but you can't do nothing about that. I'm not going to talk about the fact that, you know, we have, we have, we had 26,000 plus youth between the ages of zero and 17 in our foster care system, 
but you can't seem to find any money to help take care of the families that are willing to care for these foster kids. And don't tell me about adoption because of the 26,000 plus that are in the foster care system. We had only <clears throat> last year, only over 1,600 adoptions. So your arg all of y'all's arguments are full of holes. You're just trying to drum people up, get them all upset over what? But get out of my business. I just don't understand why we continue to have these types of conversations. And I believe our elected officials should be doing a whole lot better. And that is why I am so extremely excited to have, okay, I gotta tell y'all. First time I noticed Senator Ford was he, I tell the story all the time, so he's heard it. Uh, he was on the campaign trail in 2014 and I was, uh, you know, contemplating it. I wasn't really sure if I was going to run and I definitely wasn't sure how Indiana, even in particular, our state party would take an openly gay, openly LGBTQ plus candidate. So I watched JD, I watched how people reacted to him and I modeled a lot of my LGBTQ plus talking points and how I approach being the LGBTQ plus candidate after this man. I ran in 2016. We ended up going on speaking tours together. Either he was opening and I was closing or I was opening and he was closing. And it was an honor and a thrill to have that joy and of walking um, in that space with him. And then the wonderful thing happened. He won. Y'all, Give it up for District 29 State Senator, the Senator from Indianapolis's West Side, my friend, J.D. Ford. J.D., welcome to the show. Dana, thank you so much for having me on. It's always great to see you. Man, did you have a good holiday weekend? I did. I um, was able to, you know, kind of rest up with some friends and um, walked in the Carmel Fest uh, 4th of July parade on Monday. So shout out to the folks that walked with me and the Hamilton County Democrats uh, for organizing that. And then the Carmel Democratic Club for organizing the booth that we had at the festival. And so many people came by that booth and just was so excited to see Democrats in Hamilton County. Um, and so, yeah, I had a great weekend and you know, uh, now I'm back to work, back, you know, back to campaigning. I love it. And you know what? One of the great things about you, in my opinion, is that you are a fighter and a leader and you are unafraid to say what needs to be said on that house house floor. A lot of people don't realize how much work that you do. Talk about, if you could, please, what it was like for you first to get, win that election uh, in, in 2018. And then what has your first term as a state senator been like? Some of the highs and some of the lows. Sure. Uh, real quick before I do that, uh, you just mentioned, you know, uh, preparing, you know, for session, and that's exactly what I'm doing right now, right? You know, we're going into session July 25th, and, you know, it's not like members of Congress where we have a huge staff to help us prepare research and things of that nature. I have a legislative assistant who is also shared with another senator, and I have a press secretary uh, who also has, you know, three or four other senators on his caseload, you know, so the bulk of preparing for session, the bulk of preparing for committee or even doing a floor speech uh, is is pretty much myself and my legislative assistant, you know, so um, so that really eats up a lot of time and and I take that very seriously. I'm probably one of the few that actually reads the bills and the amendments <laughs> um, because I want to make sure that, you know, I understand what the real impact is going to be for people uh, in the district that I represent. But but to answer your question, gosh, in 2018, well, if I could, let me go back to 2014 real quick. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned that, that, you know, I was running for office in 2014. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life, Dana, was stand before my friends and family and say that I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And I had so many people connect with me after the campaign because they saw me kind of knocked down a little bit. Um, and, you know, people have shared with me, I got a divorce or I lost a business or I lost a relationship. And, you know, I saw you and I saw you get back up and get back out there. 
And, and people would share with me in the grocery store or at the bank or wherever that they felt connected to me because everyday people experience this. And, you know, I think sometimes we, you know, as elected officials, we're, you know, put on this pedestal, but I want people to know that I'm just like everybody else. You know, I'm just a regular, ordinary citizen uh, who is, you know, serving um, his peers in, in the General Assembly. But, you know, fast forward, after that night, um, my mom and I did a little retail therapy the next day. Um, and, you know, but honestly, I got right back out there and I kept serving people. I kept showing up, you know, if there was a community cleanup, if there was an event to pack backpacks for back to school, whatever the case may be, I wanted Hoosiers in my district to know that it wasn't personal. I didn't take it personal. It, it stung, you know, but I wanted to show them that I can continue to serve even if I'm not in elected capacity. And I want people to know that you can also serve your community in a non-elected capacity, you know. Um, but the 2018, and that night- You, you know what, and I wanna night. just real quick, and I think that's, yeah. that is that is the sign of a true leader, right? Because you recognize, yes, it's, this was a thing that you were working for, but it, it doesn't mean that you stop doing the work. And I think right. people miss the, that point. And we have some selfish politicians that make them think that, that that's the way it's supposed to be. Let's be real. Yeah. We, yeah. we, got, yeah. we got some folks. Yeah, and also, you know, I want other candidates to know that this election cycle, it, it may not go your way, you know, but you are doing the work. You're building that foundation. You're getting your name recognition out there. And I, I think that's half the battle. So, my, you know, my, my encouragement, my advice is that if it doesn't go your way this election cycle, continue to stay at it, continue to keep going. Because uh, who knows, you, you might just end up in the state Senate one day. Absolutely. Uh, and, that, and that's my story. My story is about persistence and perseverance. I didn't give up. I kept going. And I in that night, that election night in 2014, I vowed to myself that I wasn't going to stand before my friends and family and say I lost. Right. That was such a crappy feeling, um, you know, and so I wanted to make sure that in 2018, when we actually 2017 is when I announced uh, that, you know, we were going to give it our all and we were just going to, you know, get out there and explain to people my opponent's vision for Indiana, in my opinion, was regressive. It was mm -hmm. homophobic. It was anti-immigrant. And that wasn't the district that I represented. That, And I know that because I went out and talked to people on their front doorsteps and I explained my vision for Indiana. And, you know, election night 2018, which you mentioned was also my birthday, you know, it was so surreal. I, I remember hearing the news, and at first I was thinking to myself, this can't be. And I just remember kind of collapsing, you know, I just, you know, kind of fell to my knees because I was just so overwhelmed with, you know, just gratitude from the voters for placing their trust in me and into allowing me to be their voice at the state house. And I, and I, because of that night, and because of that feeling and how hard we worked and, and the, the amount of people, I mean, Dana, 2018 election day was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. Yeah. To be able to walk in and see close to 50 to 75 people on the phones, you know, canvassing, running people to the polls, getting food. I mean, just yeah. seeing all these people come out was just so incredible. And, and because of that, I never, ever take that for granted. Even when I walk into the state house four years later, I, I walk in there and I look at how beautiful that building is. And sometimes I stand underneath the dome and just think to myself, I made it. Yeah. But, yeah. It, but it took so much to get me there. And it's such a privilege to represent people. I, I'm, I, I'm, I often dream. JD, of being an elected official. I dream about it. I dream about getting the opportunity to argue, make an argument on the floor as I've watched you guys do. And, and it is such a pri privilege and an honor. And I love that you don't take it for granted. Y'all don't get holidays off. All the good holidays, y'all got to show up. But, you, right. but it's still a privilege. And ah, one day I might join you. Senator Black sounds good to me. <laughs> So, you know, it's not easy being, you know, the, the in the super minority. Like, at one point, there was only nine of y'all, right? Um, and, you know, we, we were able to pick up a couple seats, but not enough to, to make a dent in, in that super majority. 
you know, that that I imagine that first couple of years you were kind of trying to get your feet underneath you and understand the, the processes. But what are what is it like in those chambers and, you know, putting the crafting those policies and, you know, hoping that they get into a committee because, you know, we know how that go. Yeah, you know, I, I would say that um, representation matters. I, I really want to hone in on that tonight because, you know, up until my arrival to the Senate, we did not have any open out serving members of the LGBTQ plus community. And my, my very first session, we tackled the hate crimes bill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my opinion, we, we still don't have a hate crimes bill because, you know, they watered it down at the last minute and then the governor signed it, um, you know, because it, it left out very key important people um, in our state, uh, age, gender, and gender identity were the three categories that were left out. And what we argued was, you know, uh, particularly hate crimes, um, we know that Black trans women experience high rates of violence or sexual violence. We cannot leave them out. Um, right. And so that, that was one of the reasons why, you know, I voted against the hate crimes bill, not because I don't think that we should have a hate crimes bill, but because they intentionally singled out people and left out key important uh, categories in that hate bill, hate crimes bill. Um, yeah, that so was kind of jacked up. Session, and I had I had other colleagues come to me in tears, asking me, you know, what's it like to be, you know, um, you know, an, uh, you know, a gay person, you know, and explaining to them my stories, mm -hmm. you know, and and being able to speak at the microphone in the well of the Senate about how a bill such as this, you know, could impact me or my family, um, really, I think, touched a lot of people, you know, yeah. so. Um, and again, this is why representation matters, because up until that point, no one from our community could really go to the other cubicle of another senator and just level with that mm -hmm. particular person. Uh, of course, we had amazing LGBTQ lobbyists and allies and everybody else, but it's just, I feel like it's different when you're able to sit down and just take the senator caps off and just speak human to human. You okay, know, you don't so. have to name no names, but which which one of the little soft softies couldn't handle it? Cause you know, that was only, I mean, you ain't gotta say no names, but you know, like some people be tripping. Like, yeah. Yeah, cause I, I walk around a, a masculine woman. So I know what it's like when I go into, you know, public restrooms or where people don't know me, you know, what, did you laugh at him, JD? Like, boo. You not my type, you know. <laughs> well, I think that this particular person, you know, uh, again, I don't want to say anything. No, 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 I, no. I mean, say no names. I want to protect, you know, my my work product and privilege with that particular person. But, you know, he he did have you know members of his family um, that were part of the LGBTQ plus community. So, um, you know, and I think you know how we how we get to some of my colleagues um, is just being open and vulnerable. I, I talk about, people ask me all the time, Dana, about you know, how do we get through this, what we're dealing with this at the moment, right? And I, and I say, we gotta be honest. We gotta have honest conversations about ourselves. You know, did we do enough? Have we done enough? You know, when it comes to, you know, asking people, are they registered to vote? You mm -hmm. know, getting them to the polls, driving them to the polls. Are we asking our friends, our, our people that are in our inner circles? I mean, I think sometimes we take it for granted, particularly people that are in our business and the political business, but are our, our, our friends yeah. actually registered to vote? And are they getting people out uh, to vote? Because it's just like a little stone in the pond. And it just, it could, you could be that ripple that could have a huge effect. And a lot of these races, Dana, come down to a handful of votes. Now, the, the mayor of Zionsville, who I adore, Mayor Styron, she won her race by 88 votes. You know, and so, you know, we, I think sometimes here in our, in this red state, we get so inundated with, you know, woe is me, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, we're in a red state. My vote doesn't count. You know, they gerrymandered mm -hmm. my district so much. But what I'm saying is that, yes, that could, all of that could be true, but you still have to exercise absolutely that right to vote. Because absolutely. if we all felt that way, then of course our vote doesn't matter, right? I but I said to folks, I said, honest we got to have honest conversations we got to be vulnerable and i know that sometimes being vulnerable 
when we're feeling like we're attacked seems counterintuitive. But here's the thing. If we are vulnerable and if we share parts of our, our story with the people who are making the decisions, then they have to rest their heads on the pillow at night Hello. and deal with it. Hello. You and, I, and, I think that, and I think that that's how we, you know, and, and of course, I'm already hearing women uh, being very vulnerable and sharing very deeply personal stories. And I, and I know that that's got to be difficult, and I commend them for their courage to doing it. But I mean, you know, and, I'm, and maybe I'm giving the my colleagues on the other side a little too much credit, but I'm you hoping, are, but you I and you and, and you know what? You have to work with them because you you address them as your colleagues. At the yes. moment, they are not mine, and they don't I'm, give a dang about these people's feelings. They don't care about the way they live in. All they care about is is it like me? Are you doing it like I'm doing? And if you're not doing it like me, something's wrong with you. See, and that, then. Yeah. They cannot see past their own space and their own livelihoods. And I get fed up with that because yeah. it just, you mean, wh why should, the, I'm going to brief story. Why should the, the representative from Crawfordsville determine what happens to Muncie schools or Anderson schools or Ga he don't have, they're not having the same concerns in Crawfordsville that they're having in Gary or in Muncie. And how yeah. dare you? How so? No, they don't care. They, no, they never don't. care. And, and, I, and I figured you you might you might say that. And I think that if 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 honesty and vulnerability doesn't work, then the last thing that I will say is organize. Yes. If you don't like the policies coming out of the state house, then change the damn state house. And how we do that is we just organize. And we organize, and again, we go back to making sure that you know people you know, get out there and vote. And I know that sometimes people are feeling, well, well, you know, voting is not the answer. And I totally understand that there's, there's a lot more we can, we can do, but it is one of the ways yes. we can do it. And the role of a state legislator is now more important than ever. I mean, people literally thought presidential elections were the way to go. No, but I would argue it's your state legislative races. It's your township races. Yes. You know, it's your, it's your midterm elections that are so important because these are the people that are going to be representing you. And for far too long, we just have kind of othered, right? We said other people will do the work. Yeah. Other people will, you know, go out there and knock those doors and make those phone calls. But we all have to do it. Absolutely. At this point in our country's history, in this state's history, we all have to do it. And I'm not asking you to, to do a whole bunch of things. And this is what I go to my three T's. Come on with it. Time, treasure, and talent. Come on. Ooh. If you can't give time, perhaps you can give your treasure. Maybe you can give 25 bucks to a candidate that you jive with. Maybe you can't give money. Maybe you can give time. Maybe you can go out there and knock, you know, doors or make phone calls. On my campaign, we we listen to the volunteers. If you come to me and say, JD, I don't want to do people facing things, we'll find things for you to do. Um, that's how important this is. Right. And so, you know, I, 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 and that's what I mean by, you know, organizing. We just have got Absolutely. to organize and get people out there. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I say it all the time. Voting is the least you can do, you know, and when, you, you know, people, I'm glad you said you broke it down into your three T's. And I want to hit on the talent for a minute, only because people don't seem to think that they have any talent to contribute to the citizen government. And the, the language that I've been using as of late, now I'm certain you, you will agree with me on this. It doesn't matter what your talent is, bring it. If you don't want to talk to people, we won't have you phone bank and knock doors, but we can have you, you know, maybe do Wait, some data hard. entry. Or if you if you're not able to walk or you're not able to to do the the public facing things, maybe you can bring some water to somebody that can. It, it, there's enough for everyone to do and I, i'm so glad that you you brought that up um but yeah you have a fascinating story <laughs> you do you have a great story so you know you're you're in there and you're you're crafting your stuff and you know you i think what is it like you guys get 10 bills a se in a short session and then 15 in a long session is it like that sometimes we don't even yeah. understand the processes right how do you, what yeah, does that let's, mean let's, what does that what am I saying yeah, to these people? That. Yeah, <laughs> so in a short session, which means it's a non-budget session, 
which is what 2022 session was. And we go from January, so right after the new year, and then this year, we I think we ended March the 9th. So think about this. We put a year worth of work into two months, two and a half months of the year. That's that's nothing. To me, I, it, it, you know, to me, it's it's what I call ram and jam. Yep. You know, we, we come back the following session and we say, oh my gosh, we made all these mistakes or we didn't think about this. Really? You know, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, of course, because we rushed it through. We we just jammed it through. We didn't think about it. We didn't stop and have proper dialogue. You know, we didn't. And they never think about the unintended consequences. Never. Seriously, if I had a dollar for every time I heard the word unintended consequences, I would be, I would be a millionaire. You'd be a millionaire. That's all, that's then we can buy we us a couple of seats, JD. Go on. <laughs> But yeah, so so you know what what I when you hear the word short session, that's exactly what you mean. You also hear the word long session, and that's typically January to about May, um, and that's when we do a budget. So we craft our budget every two years, uh, and so think about this, Dana. Instead of like thinking like five years out or ten years out, we only think two years out. Yeah, because yeah. that's what the budget you know uh, entails, and so and and also. You know, because we are approaching upon a budget season starting in January of 2023, go through that budget, fine, fine tooth comb that budget because the state's budget is the outward display of what people believe in. Yep. What, what is the state priorities? Yep. Right. And so, you know, if if we're dumping money, you know, to things that you know necessarily don't need it. I think one time, you know, a couple of budgets ago, uh, was the lots of money to the hog barn at the state fair. Mm -hmm. know? So, you know, <laughs> I might have mentioned that, that. Not that that might be, you know, might not be important, but you know, I I would just argue that there's a little bit more pressing needs and priorities uh, out there. Yeah, th th those those aren't those that that would definitely be defined as a a pork, but a pump. I see what you did there. <laughs> oh gosh, you have to forgive me. Yeah, I, I mentioned I mentioned something about the Swine Pavilion uh, in my speech at the convention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so you you know okay so you cram you guys are cramming all this stuff in. How do, how does the speaker determine which bill actually gets some attention? Yeah, you know. I think, you know, there's, I, I can't really, you know, speak for the speaker. I mean, I can only imagine that, you know, the speaker and the president pro tem on my side of the house um, in the Senate uh, allow the chairman to have some flexibility on what bills get heard and what do not, what does not, you know, so in that short session that you mentioned, we only are allowed 10 bills um, and in a long session, we're allowed unlimited amount of bills to be filed. And so what I'll do is I'll take all of the bills that go to the different committees and I'll go meet with the uh, individual chairman and I'll just make my case and, and ask the chairman to please consider, you know, ha getting the bill a hearing and, and to have debate. Really, mm -hmm. that's all I'm asking for is, is to have discourse on, on the bill. Um, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, in the 2021 session, I was able to get a bill through um, and I really want people to, to think about that. You know, as a Democrat in a super majority that I was able to, you know, get a, a bill out of the Senate, get it out of the House, get it to the governor's desk for signature and, and have it be law. And that was such an awesome feeling. Which one was um, it? So this, this bill actually was brought to me by a constituent. And again, this is why constituent services, which is another thing that I pride myself on, is so important, is that this constituent reached out, and in so many words, he said, you know, there was an out-of-state company that was going to uh, misuse language in the statute to kind of open a group home for dementia and Alzheimer patients. Okay. And so we worked really hard to close that loophole and to make sure that uh, that our dementia and Alzheimer seniors um, get the best quality care in a facility that's inspected um, by the state. And so that's good. You know, I love it. Take very, care of our seniors. Very, absolutely. Very proud of that bill. And, and again, worked across the aisle um, 
you know, worked with Representative Vermillion, who's a Republican on the House side of things, uh, who helped carry my bill, uh, you know, to, you know, get it to, you know, be, you know, gotten through the House. But, you know, uh, but really, I think that, you know, is a testament to how hard I work with, you know, on behalf of my constituents. And I'm willing to work with anybody who is willing to work with me, uh, particularly when we have really good ideas uh, that are, um, you know, about protecting our seniors. But do you get some some ideas from your constituents, and you and they'll be amazing ideas, right? And you look at it, and you look at the makeup of our state house, and go, oh, this one ain't going. And yeah. then once, and then once you realize that, how do you have that conversation with your constituent? Yeah, I just I, I just level with them. I, I tell them that you know I, I went and talked to the chairman, and unfortunately, uh, the chairman said no. And you know, uh, and sometimes the chairman gives me an explanation, and sometimes they do not. They'll say, "Well, I'll I'll take a look at it," and you know, um, and you know, and sometimes they just don't. You know, they don't. Circle so it's back. really you know, at the 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 speaker or the pro tem's discretion. On what I mean, sometimes the chairman's discretion. A chair of oh, the chairman of the of the committees. That's right. Okay, yeah. so wow, so they could be. I mean, it could be a great bill, but because one knucklehead and I and I'm being facetious when I say this, but one person could have a bad day today, and your bill's not gonna get through because he just didn't want it to. Yeah. Hmm. Have you ever had a, a a constituent of another representative or another senator? Um, bring you anything? I mean, and and like you know, like say I know my senator is not gonna do anything with this. Can you help me? Yeah, you know, I'm, I I do listen, but you know, there is kind of a um, you know an unwritten rule, if you will, that that constituents really do need to you know work with their home senator. Okay. You know? Okay, um, that's fair. Yeah, and but you know, sometimes you know I will you know, listen and, and then actually go meet with that senator and say, hey, this person I know approached you, they approached me, you know, what do you think about this? Um, so that's, that's that good to know because a lot of people don't know that, right? Because they may not know that, well, I like JD or I like Senator Yoder, I'll go talk to them and I really need to be talking to Senator Bro, right? Well, yeah, I'm that, lucky. That was... <laughs> I have Senator Bro. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you make a great point. It's just like, you know, if someone from up north calls our office and says, hey, I've got this issue, you know, we we do, you know, we will ask that particular person or, you know, pass them over to the right senator to allow that senator to address it. Now, sometimes it has happened where they don't address it and they call me back and say, I haven't been able to get anybody. And then I feel comfortable uh, moving forward and, and helping uh, whenever I can. But I do want to make sure that I give the opportunity for my colleague to at least try to do it. I love it. I like that because I mean, people don't even realize that they have the a ability to influence the, the pieces of legislation that are going to be heard. And they also, you know, you, you don't, if your dude ain't working out, you tried to reach out to your dude, reach out to your dude first. Right. And then if your dude don't work out, then you're going to talk to another dude. I yeah. like that. I mean, I, I like knowing that we can do that. You know, and, and I, I think it's great that you talked about the bill that you got passed and getting it signed into law. I imagine that has to be a phenomenal feeling. But what, I've, you know, getting up the every day is... If I, if hmm? I could, yeah. um, is that, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, I, I was able to get a bill through, which was just awesome. But a lot of the stuff that I've been doing is attaching amendments to Republican bills oh. and, be, and being able to influence policy that way or to make a bill better or oh. to, you know, whatever whatever the case may be. So I'm, I may myself may never get the credit for it because the bill is in a Republican colleague's name, but, you know, it's it was the language that I attached. And I'll give you a great example of that. A couple sessions ago, I worked with Senator Travis Holdman uh, who kind of had a tax bill. Um, and again, a constituent who emailed me and said, wait a second, how come I'm also not getting credit for uh, when I'm putting money into a 529? And in this particular case, this, this constituent was still married, but filing separately mm -hmm. for, their, for their taxes. And so we were able to, you know, get that particular person also credit for the money that they're putting into a college 529 savings account. So 
Um, so we were able to work with Senator Holdman to get you know that attached, and and now people can you know benefit from that. And so and again, you know, if I I, I guess I have to do a really good job of explaining those small wins. Um, but you know, I, I think it's important for people to know is that I may not be passing a hundred bills but I'm also being able to work with my colleagues across the aisle to influence policy by bringing, you know, uh, things to their attention. And sometimes they'll take it and run with it, or they'll let me attach an amendment and, and, you know, and we can do it that way. And the other thing that I'm noticing about the two examples that you shared with us, they're not super splashy, you know, catching all the headlines, but they're significant bills nonetheless. I mean, you know, sure. we, we, it's almost like, you know, they target these social issues so that they can have these social wars so that we Hoosiers can be at each other's throat all the time. Yes. Hmm. Yep. Absolutely. And that's the other thing I think people should know is that I would say about 80% of what we do uh, in the state Senate is uh, done in unanimous fashion. All 50 of us are voting for the bill. Um, you know, uh, the other 10%, it's uh, bipartisan and, and like maybe five or, you know, 5% is when we got to go to our corners and duke it out in, in the partisan fights. But like you just said, it's, it's those partisan fights that make the news um, and, and really kind of pit us against each other. Um, you know, but when, it, when, when that happens, it's knocked down drag out. Y y yes. Because you know? um, <laughs> we read. We so because sometimes we're, we're dealing with uh, how law affects families. Uh, for example, the transgender sports ban that you just mentioned in the, in the opening of your show. Um, you know, I was, I fought so ardently about that bill uh, passing. Unfortunately, I lost that battle. Um, but that was a knockdown drag out because, you know, they were hell bent on singling out and targeting kids. Mm -hmm. And we were hell bent on saying, this is not who we are as Hoosiers. This is not what we do to kids. This is, you know, this one incident in the state of Indiana, and it was resolved at the local level yeah. by the policy of the Indiana High School Athletic Association. So yeah. let them and continue to let them do their jobs. But we are in an election year. And that yeah. was, in my opinion, all about throwing red meat to their base uh, to score some political points. At the at the detriment of Hoosier kids. Think yeah. about that. I mean, that that that's the part that just is astonishing to me. Or the or when they were going after, you know, the teachers and the school board members and 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 all of the, you know, to criminalize teaching history. Because if you if you add a fine to it, right, if there's a fine, if somebody can sue for a thousand dollars, then you are trying to criminalize teaching history. And it's like, why would you spend so much energy creating division when we have real issues? And then JD, I got to ask, why aren't they concerned about, you know, the housing crisis? Why aren't they concerned about poverty? Why aren't they concerned about high speed internet in rural Indiana? I, uh, I, I, I don't, the answer for you it's it's stuff that we've talked about it's priorities that we try to redirect our focus you know i want i want to go back real quick to the transgender sports band real quick mm -hmm. um because something that you said really uh really struck me and this was a, t a statistic that i heard in committee and that is that 85 percent of transgender and non-binary youth say that recent debates around anti-trans bills have negatively impacted their mental health mm, mm, so mm, even mm. filing a bill such as this even debating these kids very existence messes yeah. with them now don't forget this is after our u.s surgeon general back in december of last year issued a report and said our, our babies are not doing well. Our students are not doing well. This is behooves all state legislators to look at this issue. I actually had a student mental health bill, you know, this past legislative session. But like I said, even filing these bills uh, really yeah. impacts. Yeah, it's, it's totally invalidating their existence. And, right. and the fact that, you, you know, again, it goes back to those, six, those circular conversations, J.D., where we, you know, you, you, you swear you pro-life until they get here. Until you life too much. 
you know. And then they're like, whoa, oh, not that. wait a minute. <laughs> Your life ain't like my life. So your life ain't got no value. I'm gonna need you to regulate yourself over there. You go over yeah. there. Cause it's just it's it's frustrating, you know, and 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 that's why you have people who don't want to get involved in the process because it it does have take an emotional toll to continue to fight like we have to fight for stuff that we shouldn't be debating over and the things that we should be debating over, nobody's talking about. And it just yeah, and can can I put an asterisk by that particular comment when this uh, you know, Dave Ricks, the, the, the CEO of Lilly, came out and said, hey, Indiana, get your act together on the education front, in, in so many words. He was a little bit more eloquent yeah, than yeah. what I just said. <laughs> and you can you can Google that. that That's out there for public consumption. Talk, talked about that a little bit, too, at the convention. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, we, in this last session on the Senate Education Committee, I serve as the ranking minority member there. We wasted, in my opinion, 16 hours, eight hours dedicated to the CRT. By the way, I uh, was proud to have a part in killing that bill. Um, my colleagues, Senator Kadora, Senator Yoder, Senator Melton, I just adore all of those colleagues. Uh, we worked so hard, you know. Uh, you know, And also helped to have an idiot put his foot in his mouth, but go ahead. Well, that, that, that too. Um, but we worked so hard to, you know, be prepared and to just pepper them with questions and to make them stand on their feet and explain, you know, how this is going to be implemented. How is this going to work? How are you going to enforce it? Um, and, you know, I think, unfortunately, I did have a colleague on the other side who did step in it a little bit. But, uh, and we also received uh, the Friends of the Education Award through the Indiana State Teachers Association for all the work that we did, but but that committee, we could have dedicated our time talking about important issues mm -hmm. uh, like our student mental health, you know, and mm -hmm. about teachers and, you know, uh, all that stuff, but we, we got caught up in the social divisive issues of the CRT bill and the transgender sports ban bill. It seems like if we spend a little time talking about mental health and with these young people, maybe they stop shooting people. I mean, just the thought. And here, and here's the thing, Dana, is that you know they every time a mass shooting happens, Republicans scream and shout from the rooftops that it's mental health, it's mental health. But they're not funding it, and they're attacking social and emotional learning. That's happening at our own state house. You know, we, my colleagues on the Senate Education Committee, we really had to uh, kind of buckle down and really fight for social and emotional learning. Um, you know, and so it's it's just so it's so rich to hear them say that it's mental health, but then to see them actively attack it and actively not fund it, uh, it's really just kind of. Do know, they ever give an explanation or a reason to why they say a thing is a thing but not do anything about the thing? They never. I mean, that's that's th so. Those are the inside scoops I'll be trying to get. Like what, how are they really, what are they saying? How do they quantify any of this? Cause it, there's gotta be more reason than well, we just don't want to, you know? Okay. So, you well, know what? I think, mm -hmm. Go ahead. The only thing I can say about, you know, I, I've heard, you know, just in testimony from this far right QAnon group called the purple for parents, mm. um, you know, they, I, I, if, if you all have not heard of this group, just, just go to their Facebook page. You know, I've been the recipient of their attacks. It's it's just gross. Yeah. Um, and frankly, it doesn't belong in our in our dialogue, in my opinion. Um, but they're there, and they're saying that social emotional learning, you know, is indoctrinating our kids and making our kids weak. You know, and it's just no social emotional learning is so important for our kids. They need to understand how can I process what just happened to me when I may have had another student, you know, get into a verbal altercation with me or even a physical altercation. How can I process that? And, you know, how can I use, you know, how can I walk away or use my words as a defense as opposed to, you know, resorting to violence? And I'm talking about, you know, uh, at the second or third grade level. I mean, by the Jeez. time they get older, it's a little bit too late for that. And so, you know, so and, and the other thing I'll say is that these are life skills for us. Yeah. We want these kids to learn this to be... Yeah. You know, good productive members of our society, but but Republicans for whatever reason, going back to your, you know, they're not, you're really pro life. You know, they they don't really want that, and I don't understand why they would not want to set up these kids for success. And you and you said something that was that triggered something. You know, the argument always is the parent should be doing that, but we just got to talking about twenty six thousand 
kids in the foster care system. So that's 26,000 already behind the eight ball because they don't, they don't have stable, regular parents. Then you have yeah. the meth crisis or the opioid crisis. So those parents are not teaching any emotional learning. So, so you mean to tell me, unless the parent, you, we're not going to offer anything to our children because we want the parents to do it. But if the parent's not capable of doing it, oh, well. See, that's, that's yeah. not cultivating a strong society. And that's the part that kills me. It's like, it's not just about the kid. It's about the society as a whole. That's right. All right, yeah. all right, enough of the bad stuff. Enough of the, enough of the, you know what? We want to reelect you, JD. We we're, we want to move us forward. Yes. You're on the ballot this year. What people, some people don't know, half the Senate is is up um, every couple of years. So only 25 of the 50 are up, and you're on the ballot this year. That's right. And you, you've spent some time now, and you've also talked to constituents. What does the next uh, uh, term for JD Ford, Senator Ford, look like? What are the things are you that you're working on? Yeah, you know, so one one of the things that I'm I'm sharing with folks as I go out and make the case uh, to be rehired is that democracy is on the ballot this November. Fighting for our tradition traditional public schools is on the ballot this November. Protecting social and emotional learning exactly what we just talked about is on the ballot this November. Gun reform on the ballot this November. You know, um, reproductive rights on the ballot this November. And so, you know, for me, uh, sitting in the chair that I sit in, uh, I'm able to unabashedly fight for the people of my district. Yeah. You know, I don't have, you know, uh, you know, Senator Greg Taylor is our leader. He's doing a great job leading our caucus. He doesn't come to me with his thumb on me and saying, you're going to vote this way or I'm going to do this or that. I don't have that. But I guarantee you, you know, there that's happening on the other side of the aisle because mm -hmm. most of the decisions is not made on the floor. Right. It is made inside that caucus room before they come down to the floor. Wow. And they all fall in line, you know. And so I just feel like, you know, I'm able to just be myself, be genuine. I'm our only outserving member of the LGBTQ plus community. I'm a millennial, so I'm one of the youngest of our state Senate. I bring a unique perspective, you know, to some of these decisions and policies that are going to impact me and my kids and my grandkids. I mean, some of my colleagues are nearing the end of their career. So they mm -hmm. not some of them should have, their career should have been over a long time ago. Well, <laughs> You know, so, uh, and the other thing I, I'm really proud is that after the 2020 election, my colleagues elected me to serve as our caucus chair. And what that means is that while we're in session, I'm the quarterback kind of keeping us rowing in the same direction. Um, when I'm out of session, I serve as our campaign chair uh, for candidates that are on the ballot. So, you know, there's just a lot of work to do both inside the state house and outside, you know, to, uh, to really, you know, travel the state and find candidates to run in these districts um, that people can relate to. And, and hopefully we can start winning and, and chipping away. I'm, I'm excited. Some people say I'm a little crazy because mm -hmm. they're like, you know, you know, they just redistricted the, the maps and for the next 10 years. But I look at this as the glass half full. Yeah. I, I see an opportunity and I know that we can make a difference if we get the right candidates and we train them and give them a page out of my playbook. And that is get out there and talk to people because when they do that, when, 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 candid, when voters are standing in the ballot box, one candidate visited me and, and talked to me and found common ground and one guy or gal did not even bother to do that. Mm. I think that even sometimes moderate people or even people of the opposite party will give you a shot because you took the time to come and ask them what was on that. Absolutely. Mind. So I, there's so much more work to be done. Um, you know, I've, I already have a list of bills. I, I'd love to get filed for the 2023 session to continue. If you could give, can you give us a snippet of some of the topics? Sure. Uh, let me pull it up real quick. I mean, because you know, we you know, we want to know. We want to know what 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 a JD four bill gonna look like. Yeah. So again, you know, talking about how our kids are not doing well. So you know, continuing that conversation on student mental health, allowing foster parents to have a greater voice in court proceedings, 
Um, you know, we talked about that. Um, you know, I'm I'm really tired of you know the governor uh, issuing a veto, but then this the supermajority just overrides that veto, right? Um, so so maybe we need to change the veto rules uh, mm. in terms of how many people uh, need to. And I know that some of my colleagues might be interested in that. I love it. I like that um, one. Addressing college debt, um, you know, right now kindergarten uh, is optional, um, DNA collection, uh, continuing my work on marijuana reform <laughs> in our state. Um, yeah, there's there's just so much. Um, oh, the, one of the things that really got me thinking was that, you know, we have a cold um, winter moratorium uh, so people don't get their electricity cut off. I think we should have an ex extreme heat moratorium. Hello? I mean, some of these some of these days have just been unbearable. And if, and if you think about it, you know, you're sitting in a home with no air conditioning, you're, I mean, and some of our seniors again, um, you know, so, so really Dana, my work at the Senate has been about advocating for people who may not have a voice in the state house. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna continue to keep doing. And, and every time someone says, you know, well, what is JD Ford doing? And people say, you know, he's advocating for our kids or, and, you know, he's taking on DCS, he's taking on the payday lenders. You know, I, I just think that, you know, those are all compliments for me. Well, somebody that's asking that question, JD, they are not paying attention, real talk. Hey, okay, so we've come to the end of the show and you know, you and I can stand around and talk forever, but I try yes. to keep it at, a, at around an hour. Um, but I do want to ask you, tell the people where they can find you. Okay, for the campaign. You. Yes, for the campaign side of things, uh, you can go to JD Ford for State Senate. Uh, that's the Facebook page. I'm at JD4IN29 on Twitter and uh, SenatorJD4.com uh, for the campaign site. So, um, and, and there you can um, check to see if you're registered to vote. IndianaVoters.com is the best place to do that, but you can do that on my website. You can also give a small contribution if you'd be so inclined to do that. Um, and we also have a store. You could buy a bumper sticker. Uh, we had our uh, special edition Pride t-shirts that we used uh, in the Pride Parade. So you can do all of that on the website um, and certainly reach out if I can ever be helpful to anybody. I love it. And do you have any events coming up? Uh, yeah. Uh, so this uh, Saturday morning, um, I'll be uh, at our campaign space at 1505 West Oak Street uh, in Zionsville, uh, just right next to the post office there in Zionsville. Uh, kicking off some canvases. Um, so, you know, if uh, you got a couple hours you want to can spare on a Saturday, come on out. We'd love to have you. Uh, but again, go to our website. We'll have a comprehensive list of events there. And I'm going to, I don't normally do this. And, you know, I know I'm going to, I'm going to catch flack for this because people are going to be like, she didn't do that for me. Uh, normally during the course of the show, I tell people, if you like something that our candidates say, I've included their Act Blue link for you to donate to their campaign. But what he won't, because JD is a kind man, what he won't say is that they're they're coming for him. Y'all need to yeah. understand that they are coming for him. You hear, if if just the way he his delivery doesn't tell you that he's a calming force within that state house, then you're not paying attention. So I'm gonna make a specific and special request that each and every person that is listening to the show. Click on the link on the Facebook page or go find him on Act Blue and donate to his campaign. He's the only LGBTQ plus person we have elected in the entire state house, period. And as you see, they continue to come after our community and we need somebody in there. And I haven't seen anybody else on the ballot just yet. There might be someone I might be missing it. Don't sweat me because I don't know everything, but, but, but he's in there. And he knows how it works. He has some institutional knowledge now. So please, $5, $5. If you have $5, please donate to his campaign. Please, please consider do giving up one Saturday, one month between now and election day to do some canvassing for him. Just knock on the doors. You, you, you I'm, I'm making the ask for JD because, you know, uh, of all the people and all the Democrats that I love, I've been endorsing him all year long. I knew he didn't have a primary opponent, so I could. As you can see, his sign is still back there. I haven't taken it down. His sign was the only sign that I've had up in my background, except for this one I got from Christine Bohm up in District 3. Had enough. I loved it. But, but guys, 
this is serious business. Here's someone who is genuine about why he wants to serve. We need your help to get him back. I thank you so much, sir, for coming. Um, before we go tonight, y'all, <clears throat> it has been, oh gosh, a crazy summer so far. We've unfortunately had more mass shootings and needless loss of life than any society can be able to sustain for a significant amount of time. We've had the highest court in our land say that an AR-15, a concealed weapon, has more rights than a woman to control the autonomy of her body. You know, and the list goes, and the number of sexual assault cases that continue to pop up of people touching little kids is just driving me insane. And all of these things can weigh on you and they can, they can bog you down and they can wear on you. And you think to yourself, I'm going to bury my head in the sand. I don't want any more of this. I want to get away, but I implore you not to do that. I am going to implore you. Yes. Self-care is so incredibly important and you should find that self-care, but sometimes that self-care is in family. Sometimes that self-care is in friends. And sometimes that self-care is in like-minded individuals coming together and figuring out solutions to the real problems that we have. But you also, have, one other thing I want to leave you with is this, find some joy. I know it sounds difficult. I know you're telling yourself, there ain't no nothing to be joyful about. Let me tell you something. For 400 years, people of African descent were enslaved on this continent. There's no way in hell you're going to tell me that they were happy working for free, having their family split up, being raped, being maimed, being tortured, to profit, to help somebody else profit. But I know for a fact that the people that went through those 400 years of torture found joy. If it was just in joy in having a baby, if it was just in joy in seeing the sun rise, if it was in joy in having your favorite meal, if it was just joy having a stimulating conversation, there was joy. And if those people can find joy, in the midst of this turmoil that we're going through, you too can find some joy. But what I even suggest is that once you find that joy, you pass it on to somebody else and you all get involved in the citizen government. We are the people they talking about, y'all. We are the people. I beg you, I implore you, please, please, please stop complaining about what somebody else ain't doing. Stop complaining about what the party ain't doing. Stop complaining about what JoJo around the corner ain't doing. Put your boots on, put your big boy pants on, and you go do something. But find some joy. Because we need you all to be healthy and safe. And Indiana Zone is always here. Hit me up. D Dana at indianazone.com. And we can talk about it. All right, y'all. You know me. I got shows booked up. I'm excited about all the candidates. Um, I'm letting y'all know now. There are certain candidates that I'm going to have on the show. And it's just going to be me and them. Like this. All three of our statewide women who are running, I got them by themselves because I want y'all to hear from them. And I'm going to do a special, a special with Mayor McDermott. Also, Marion County folks, look for some notices from IDAC. We want you to meet our Marion County candidates from our township people all the way up to the state level. We working on some things. All right, get busy, find some joy, and I'll holler at y'all next week. Peace.